And I think that I mentioned at least three times that we will have a panel. So it doesn't matter if I mention the fourth time after Stephen finished. Stephen is a Kiwi, so we expect to have a fantastic localistic presentation now. Go ahead. to uh, talk about uh, um, how Haskell, the Haskell programming language approaches the problem of parallelization. Uh, first of all, what is the Haskell programming language? It's a general purpose programming language. It's a functional programming language. Uh, and it's not object oriented. It's pure, which I'm going to be talking a lot about. It's lazily evaluated, strongly statically typed with an advanced type system a stable, mature um, open source implementation, and strong library support, and it's quite fast. So what's good about Haskell? Uh, compared to mainstream languages, it's um, easier to ensure correctness, um, uh, very uh, powerful abstraction capabilities. Uh, the code is very maintainable. Uh, development time is, is shortened because it's uh, very good. High assurance. Um, uh, it gives you um, a very good high quality assurance for your software. So, what are the challenges of parallelizing code? Uh, I've just listed them here. Uh, hopefully you uh, are familiar with all of these. Now, one of the s main synchronization issues that uh, people come across is race conditions. Um, and the problem is that if, if your code is threaded, and you have a um, mutable state, and you lock that state with mutexes, then the code becomes deterministic. So you get unpredictable race conditions and all these kinds of problems. Now, Haskell programmers don't really like race conditions, so they eliminate them altogether. And this is how. It's done through a thing called purity, uh, which uh, we were hearing about um, share nothing earlier today. So this is share nothing taken to its extreme, essentially. So. Um, uh, Haskell absolutely enforces purity. Uh, there are only, as far as I know, well, there are not very many pure languages, and I, I don't really want to list them, otherwise I might miss one out. Um, but it's also known as referential transparency. The function is a function of, in the mathematical sense. So the, uh, if you give it the same inputs, you always get the same output. And that means you have to have no internal state. And it also means that... Uh, you can't pass a reference around that points to something that you modify. Everything has to be immutable. And so if you have no mutable state, then you can't possibly have a race condition. So Paul um, here is talking to, uh, about the Mercury programming language, which is also pure. Um, so uh, that's what you need to pay attention to out of this talk. Um, all, uh, yeah, all data dependencies are... Um, are explicit when you have purity. Um, the compiler um, is, is aware of all the dependencies. Um, it, it also means that there's no concept of sequence, so the compiler's free to rearrange the sequence however it likes. Um, so here's an example of a sequence dependency. You want to make sure that these two operations are performed in the right order. Okay. So uh, pure code is... Uh, has its own advantages. It's not a sacrifice at all. In fact, it's the exact opposite of a sacrifice. Um, it makes the code simpler and cleaner, and uh, this is a very good thing. So um, it does this because it's semantically simpler, um, and that's quite difficult to put into words, but that's a nice short description of it. And it means you don't have to play what if. You know, all these different, you don't have to work so hard to reason when you're coding. So anyway, this is basically what Haskell is all about and what purity gives you by itself. Now, Haskell is also <coughs> lazily evaluated. What that does is it separates the description of the computation from the sequence in which that computation is performed. And, and then you have a, a, a strategy to um, evaluate that. So. Um, 
uh, parallelism then becomes your evaluation strategy. Uh, at least if you, you can use a parallel or a sequential evaluation strategy. Now, uh, here's uh, just an indication of how fast Haskell is. These are, according to the computer language benchmarks, uh, these are the top 15 fastest languages, and Haskell is number 10. So, purity is an excellent starting point for parallelism. It makes the whole problem a lot simpler. The very few, um, it, it eliminates a lot of the problems, all your race conditions and deadlocks, essentially but it doesn't solve it by itself. Now here's something that um, functional programmers get all snotty about, and that is that parallelism is not the same as concurrency. Um, concurrency is the familiar threading abstraction. It can be used as a method to achieve parallelism, but parallelism is just using multiple cores to, um, to take advantage of multiple cores or processes. So there are three methods that Haskell has of parallelizing things. Uh, the last one is, uh, is not complete at the moment, but the first two, I'll go through those. <laughs> first one is concurrency, which is a familiar thread abstraction. It has a, a severe disadvantage that it's non-deterministic, and what I mean by that is um, if you give it the same inputs, you're not necessarily going to get the same output because it depends on a lot depends on the sequence, and so this is where this is the great source of bugs. Now, um, uh, a thread in Haskell, um, when it manipulates data, it's doing everything immutably, which means that you can't have race conditions, uh, and so it doesn't. Haskell doesn't give you mutexes; instead, it gives you a, different, a, a variation of different kinds of pipes. But um, um, it. Haskell is not strong in the area of um, distributed processing uh, in the same way that Erlang is. Now, this is the really good bit. This is the bit. This is what. This is the way you can uh, parallelize your co your computations in Haskell. What you do is you get your code and you just put little annotations on, saying, "I want to evaluate this bit in parallel." Um, now, this is a clue, and the compiler has the ability to do whatever it likes with it. Now. These are just added on the ends of lines and so on, so it's very non-invasive, which means um, that it's very easy to just play about with it and, s and see if you can achieve results. But the whole process is a manual process, so you have to do a lot of measuring and so on. But the, the key point is that it's deterministic, so it's absolutely safe. Um, the worst thing you're going to do is make it run slower. So this is, uh, this is the Haskell way of how to structure a, a program. What you do is you get the I.O. and you put it all around the outside and you, you try to make the, the inner core of the program absolutely pure and mutable. And then you can parallelize this bit here and it's a much easier problem. So I uh, put this into practice. So I um, wanted to use a, a very real example. So I had a, an attempt and it was a total disaster. So um, what the conclusion essentially was that um, I thought there was going to be exploitable parallelism in it somewhere, but I, I, after a lot of work, I realized that actually it wasn't there. So I had another attempt. This is a simpler problem, but it's also a real-world problem. Um, I, uh, it's compressing, po uh, compressing polygons into a quad tree, which means you have to split them up to fit them into the quad tree nodes, uh, and it was much more obviously parallelizable. So this is what it looks like at the output of the, of the program. Um, and you can see uh, they've been split up into very sized bits. So the first thing I did was I made it look like my diagram at the beginning. I cleaned up the code so that it was uh, all the I.O. was factored out of the, of the internal logic. I added some annotations. It took me a little while. I had to spend a bit of time measuring. I had to sort of gain the skills to do it. And I graphed the results. So this is the thread scope tool. And um, there, there, is, there are some places here where I've failed to achieve um, parallelism. And I looked into it, and I figured out the problem was I had some absolutely enormous polygons. Um, and my, um, my polygon clipping algorithm was not able to run in parallel. So that it would completely blocked when it got, when it got um, a really enormous polygon. So you can see I'm achieving parallelization in some places, but not in others. 
Now the orange bit is garbage collection. And here is it, I'm zooming in a bit here, and you can see in some parts it's doing a lot of garbage collection, and in other parts it's doing much more processing, which is the green. And this shows you the degree of parallelization you're achieving. So, it was a real world problem. It was uh, garbage collection heavy, which is actually tends to be true more for functional languages because there are a lot of optimizations to, to reduce the amount of memory allocation, but um, quite often you use a lot of it so that the languages are optimized to work that way. Um, I didn't really manage to parallelize the polygon clipping. Now here are my results. Um, remember that I didn't really achieve full parallelization on it, but as you can see, they're not that brilliant, the, um, but I've, I've split it here into um, mutator and garbage collector. Now the mutator is what you call the bit that does the processing, the garbage collector is the memory management, obviously. So, um, so um, the garbage collector didn't perform very well at all, it didn't parallelize at all. It, it is a parallel garbage collector. You can see there's a, a cost when we actually go to parallel. Yeah. Yes, I, I didn't want to fight um, OpenOffice, so I just left it the same size as it was. This is the number of CPU cores, and this is elapsed time to run the, the program. So that's, yeah. Sir? Yes, exactly. That's true. Ah, this, um, this is... Um, I believe, I'm, I'm not absolutely certain, but I believe that this is caused by an issue with uh, Stop the World, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. The, the garbage collector completely stops the execution of the, the program. So um, there's a cost to starting that up. And that, I, I think, is the problem here, but I'll get into that a bit more. Here are some reasons why um, an annotation might not work. Now, I'm um, a little short on time, so I'm going to skip through a few of these reasonably quickly. But uh, measurement is absolutely essential in this process because it's a manual process. Um, so here, here's what you need. You need to, you do need to understand Haskell's evaluation, uh, lazy evaluation. There's a learning curve associated with it. Um, you need to understand your program, and you need to get a bit of practice in doing this. Uh, thread scope. Um, could do with a little bit of improvement. It's a bit hard to associate the execution of the program with the point in the program, which is fine for small programs, but I was, I was doing this on a very large program. Um, now, the parallel garbage collector is still relatively new. Um, they're developing all this stuff very quickly. Uh, there's been an enormous amount of progress in the last little while, but um, one of the problems with it that's been mentioned is uh, that there's no thread local memory allocation as yet. So um, garbage collector has to stop everything and that gives you a bit of lock contention and I believe that that is the reason for these problems when you get into the higher numbers of cores. Uh, so it's a manual process uh, but it gives you relatively painful, uh, painless, not painful, <laughs> relatively, it's got a bit of pain to it but it's relatively no painless, it. <laughs> relatively painless parallelism. Um, you do have to work at it a little bit, but the important thing is that the risk of introducing, of introducing bugs is zero. And here's an example of code with an annotation in red. Um, so it's calculating a whole lot of things, and at the end it compresses everything. And so this parallelizes the compression of a number of these polygons. Now, this is the future work data parallel Haskell. Um, it's a, the idea is that um, you have nested data parallelism. It's like map reduce only here it is. So this is more or less the way map reduce and other data parallel um, things work. And what, what data parallel Haskell promises is that the, the individual operations that you're doing in parallel can be parallel ones, which means that you get a tree structure instead of a flat structure. And uh, how this works is that we get this tree structure, put it through a transformation, and it turns into a flat structure. Now this is 
quite a complicated process. Um, but it can be done because it has been done before. So I'll, I'll explain this in a second. It's, um, here are some, just a general idea of what it's all about. Now, these are the steps that are described in how it's done. Now, the reason why it can be done is because there's been a research project that's, that has achieved it, but it's never been put into a mainstream language. So that's what they're attempting to do here. And here are the names of the people who are doing it. Um, now, here's the conclusion of my talk. Um, this implementation depends utterly on Haskell's purity. Now, not only is hardware becoming more parallel, but a point that people sometimes miss is software is becoming more complex. So maybe the industry can solve these problems without discarding mutable state, or maybe it will come to the same conclusion that um, functional programmers have. Uh, and here's some propaganda. Functional, pure functional propaganda. First of all, mutable state leads to dependency. As you can see, each of these lines may or may not depend on the previous line. This is a pseudo C++ or something. Um, and it's a very difficult problem to figure out whether that's true or not. The other thing is shared memory, of course. I, I only wrote kills there, so it would look good, doesn't it? Yeah. So um, uh, it, it greatly complicates the... Um, uh, shared memory greatly complicates the, the parallelism problem as well. It um, adds a lot of contention. So can we really afford to keep using mutable state? That is the big question I will leave you with. And here is the future. And that's the end. Thank you, Stephen. And uh, he, Stephen gave... Yes, sorry, sorry. sorry. <laughs> There are a few statements that you left open, and I believe that somewhere just want yeah. to pull you in. Do you want to take the question of the yes. gentleman, which is yep. keen to? Yes. And in the meantime, could, could, you, could you please stop this because we need to change this. Yep. So, so, so this is not the first time I've heard the uh, pure language propaganda. Yep. The first time I heard it was in but the, the so that doesn't have any well, <laughs> it depends on it depends on whether you're using functional languages or not. Oh, okay. Well, the only well, real difference. Right. Uh, yeah, I I don't really have time to go into all that, but um, the, the, essentially the, the difference now to what it was before is that the the um, implementations have come a lot further. That's essentially it. Yeah. Any other question? <laughs>